In June 2010, the eyes of the world were on South Africa as it hosted the largest international sporting event in the world, the Football World Cup. It was billed as FIFA's most successful World Cup to date and its president, Sepp Blatter, gave South Africa a 9 out of 10. Moreover, the tournament provided a month-long reprieve from the usual bad news about crime, corruption and poverty that has plagued the nation in recent years and gave ordinary South Africans a chance to bask in the limelight of this huge accomplishment. Our ability to host an event at this level reflects that we have some real capacity in terms of construction, a real capacity in terms of industrial capacity and also uh, to, to generate the, the services uh, that are required. But it's only now, months after the World Cup has ended and the fans have gone home, that this country can finally assess how it moves forward and how it overcomes the huge number of challenges that it faces. The ANC must get tremendous credit for the World Cup. But if we have to give it credit, we must also blame it for the things that it has not been able to fulfill. The question we have is if you can bring down crime by 70% by some estimates during the World Cup with the foreigners, why can't you do it for your own citizens? The World Cup briefly united the South African nation across racial and class lines but the euphoria would not last. It did not benefit from the World Cup. Instead, more money should have been used to improve other structures. The World Cup, they, they have spent their money. Now it's time for them to spend money on us. Less than a month after the tournament, over 1.3 million public sector workers embarked on a series of open-ended nationwide strikes calling for an 8.6% wage increase and a housing allowance of about $130 a month. Schools, hospitals and public offices were affected as teachers, nurses and government workers demonstrated their rejection of the government's offer of a 7% increase. As more and more politicians are being accused of corruption through self-enriching business deals, unions were perhaps less inclined to acquiesce to the government's offer. You can't have one part of society being extra rich and another part of society being extra poor. The inequality is totally unacceptable. What we are seeing today in our country is that those who work very hard are the ones that are paid pittance. Jacob Zuma, who relied on the support of organized labor to rise to the presidency, is now under increasing pressure to find a solution that satisfies the people who voted him into power, while managing the country's deficit at the same time. We need our cries not to fall on deaf ears, because if they don't listen to us, who put them into power? It's us who put them to power, and we're in a majority. We elected this government. It must be very sensitive to our needs as people of this country. Amidst talk of mounting tensions between leftist and nationalist factions within the ANC, Zuma is left steering a party that has been accused of losing its democratic soul. Alexandra Township in Johannesburg is spitting distance from Samton, one of the wealthiest areas on the African continent. It's estimated about half a million people live here in a few square kilometers, many in shacks and hostels. Fifteen years ago, the overwhelming majority of black South Africans in places like Alexandra voted for the ANC, in part because of their promise of a better life for all, and also because the moral authority of the ANC throughout the liberation struggle meant that people believed they would be in power for generations. And yet, 15 years later from that point, people in places like Alexandra have grown increasingly disenchanted with the ANC's inability to close the gap between rich and poor. The divides that were once black and white are now socio-economic in nature. 
13 and a half million people now rely on social grants to survive and with the World Cup over, job losses are on the rise as South Africans really begin to feel the impact of the global recession. There's no question uh, that the money could have been much better spent on many more important issues. Could we have spent that much more effectively on, on education? Could we have spent it much more effectively on clinics? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we are in the midst of the biggest pandemic, HIV pandemic in the world. Uh, we've got a major crisis around education. Uh, so clearly there are a whole range of areas where we could have spent the money better. The question that often the left who, makes, who make this argument don't consider is how likely was it for political elites to have spent the money in those areas? Rustenburg, 80 miles northwest of Johannesburg, is the fastest growing city in South Africa. But even here, the effects of the economic downturn are becoming increasingly evident. In many respects, Rustenburg is a microcosm of the wider South Africa. There's huge mineral wealth here, especially of platinum. But it's also had an economic boom over the last few years, which has attracted people from the rest of South Africa in search of work. But now, workers once employed in the boom time stand on the sides of roads, hoping to be collected for a day's casual labor here and there. We used to think that maybe by the World Cup there are going to be more jobs, but hey, there was no change. Really? Uh, okay. We didn't even see the difference. Look, tell me how it was before and compared to now. No, before it was best. Uh, but yeah. nowadays yeah. you can spend almost three months without getting a job. Okay. There have been a lot of retrenchments and everybody retrenched comes to the street to look for a job, mm. you see. And even if you get the job, um, in the days we are living in, the money that they pay, sometimes it's just from hand to mouth. The unemployment crisis is a product of the fact that semi-skilled or unskilled people just do not have the skills base that is required for the economy. The kinds of jobs being created by our growth strategy is high-level skills. It's done its skills in the financial sector, in the banking industry, in the IT industry. So the very people who are unemployed cannot do the very jobs that are the vacancies that are created because the skills gap is such a huge one. We have uh, very serious uh, challenges. Now, a major challenge is actually to, to boost uh, labor absorption and to set ourselves on a new growth path in which uh, we actually grow decent employment opportunities for our people. That, that's our quest, that's our challenge. Because of the legacy of apartheid, one of the challenges in this country over the last 16 years has been to make a more equitable distribution of, of, of the economic pie in this country. There's still huge disparities. Um, where do you think South Africa ranks in terms of redistributing economic wealth? Well, I don't think we're anywhere near 9 out of 10. Many homes in the townships that surround the city of Rustenberger shacks. Their occupants wait in line for what are called RDP houses, part of the ANC's reconstruction and development program, which aims to provide a free house to everyone in the country who earns less than $500 a month. While over a million houses have been constructed countrywide, millions more will need to be built if the government is to make good on its promise and often fly-by-night operators, given government tenders, build substandard housing or simply disappear with the money. But Rustenburg is also an anomaly. Just outside the city is the town of Pokeng, the capital of the royal Bafakeng nation, ruled by King Molotlehi. He, along with hereditary and elected leaders, governs 300,000 people spread over 1,400 square kilometers. In 1924, platinum was discovered on their land, but it was only in 1999 that the Bafakeng finally won a lengthy legal battle to be recognized as the region's landowners. As a result, they have a share of the mineral wealth of this land, which puts them in a unique position to be able to help their own communities directly in order to solve some of the huge social and economic problems that blights the wider South Africa. The Bafakeng Nation's investment portfolio now stands at 4 billion US dollars. They own the only privately run World Cup stadium in the country where the English team was based during the World Cup. 
With the income derived from the mines, they have embarked on an ambitious social upliftment project. In some ways, the community here is fortunate because you do have wealth from the land to be able to invest in things like this. That isn't true in those other parts of South Africa where stadiums have been built for the World Cup. And this country still sees the biggest gaps between rich and poor of anywhere in, 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 in the world. The history of this country, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's going to take long to narrow the gap. And firstly, if you know, history wasn't just about the rich and the poor. It was deeply embedded into separating people. Whether you're rich or poor, you'd be separated in terms of color. And, and that made it difficult for the, you know, the, 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 the economy of the country to grow and, and benefit every citizen of the country. And it's going to need communities on their own, not to look at the government itself to, to make these changes. And now the model that the Bafugeng are using is basically to look at those key aspects. Education being the key, of course. You look at the health and, 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 and use whatever means to try and speed up those programs. And, and, and programs such as sports development do add speedily to try and, and get to you know, uh, achieving all those goals. After identifying hunger as the root cause for poor performance and attendance at school, the Bafakeng have rolled out a feeding scheme that currently benefits over 9,000 children in their area. They fund ambulances, patient transport and extra nurses at the state-run hospital. They have upgraded infrastructure and are looking to the time when platinum runs out by creating industry and growing agriculture. If the political governance can copy some of the good things that we are doing here, I think they can do better. Like now the problem that is facing a South African local government is corruption, mismanagement and, and other things. You know? But we say, we say, we think we are better than them. Because me as a, as a traditional leader, I'll be a leader, I'm a leader for life. Now, when I make a decision, I make sure that I make the decision that I can live with. And I want the decision that my grandchildren can, can respect me. The issues of inequality and wealth redistribution in South Africa have been much discussed ever since the end of apartheid. Black economic empowerment, a policy put in place by the ANC government to redress these inequalities, has not had the trickle-down effect that was originally expected, but instead has created a wealthy black elite, many of whom are card-carrying ANC members and party officials. Basically, South Africa's operated as a club ever since the first diamonds and gold, and gold were found. It's been a glorious club. And now we've got to have an open economy. I've been a proponent of black economic empowerment because we had a very distorted economy uh, in 1994 because of apartheid. And it had to be corrected as, as soon as possible. So taking the commanding heights of the economy and establishing targets and scorecards was absolutely reasonable. But what we shouldn't kid ourselves is that that influence the lives of the majority of the citizens of the country. It didn't. It changed the membership of the club. <laughs> you have to understand that the ANC has changed dramatically from the previous idiom that it used to have. Now, some people after 1994, the ANC felt that now is our time. You know, even in the World Cup here, we, we had a, a slogan, Kinako, meaning it is our time. So other people looked at this, it is our time in material terms. They felt that now nah, I must grab it while it is still there. We must loot. I mean, the, South Africa today has become a looter's paradise. You see, even uh, the people who have been fighting idealistically to get liberation for the downtrodden are now saying that no one I must get my large share. So this Luther's paradise issue, it has become the cancer of our society. The big challenge now 
is how to eliminate the, the corruption that runs through the stream of our social life. Because many people are now using politics in order to line their pockets. And allegedly, that includes the president. Jacob Zuma and members of his family have secured shares in companies worth hundreds of millions of dollars through black economic empowerment deals. Deals that have not gone through an open tender process or have been awarded in exchange for political favors. Many others in the ANC have done the same. There are issues about that have been raised in public, especially uh, elements of favoritism or uh, debates about um, politically connected individuals benefiting from a lot of the deals. Part of the problem is that um, companies in, in that have been doing business in this country have themselves been seeking black people who are connected, who are connected politically. So it's not just a problem with government, but it's also a problem with the, the private sector itself. There is a, a very serious commitment on the part of government to actually fight corruption wherever it manifests itself. The irony is that when Jacob Zuma ousted Thabo Mbeki as leader of the ANC in 2007, it was, amongst other things, seen as a rejection of the enrichment process going on amongst the small elites. But at the same time, those who supported Zuma's bid for the presidency, the trade unions, the Communist Party and the ANC Youth League, were willing to overlook the fact that he was facing corruption charges of his own. In 1999, the South African government decided to spend uh, 60 billion rand on um, military equipment. And that was really the start of, of the Jacob Zuma corruption saga, if I can call it like that. Um, that deal was investigated by the Scorpions, who was disbanded subsequently by the ANC. But the Scorpions was a corruption-busting unit, and they managed to find documents implicating Jacob Zuma in accepting a bribe from French arms company Thales. Um, in, in, in exchange for his support and protection of the company in South Africa during the bidding process. But a matter of weeks before the 2009 elections, the charges against him were abruptly dropped. That was a watershed moment for South Africa, the dropping of the charges against Jacob Zuma. Helen Ziller is the leader of the Democratic Alliance, South Africa's strongest opposition party that won over 16% of the vote in the 2009 election. They also won the Western Cape, making it the only province in the country not governed by the ANC. Despite being the only party to have grown their support base in the last three elections, it is still perceived by many, whether correctly or not, as a group that looks after white interests. We're trying to establish an open society, a society driven by genuine opportunities for all. Affirmative opportunity, we call it. And that vision is the alternative to the closed crony society for the politically connected elite. The biggest challenge is to enable people and offer them the wherewithal to escape from poverty. We have to accept that millions of South Africans who have just entered the job market as young people with very few skills are unlikely ever to have a job. I take it from that that you believe that education in South Africa is in somewhat of a crisis? Yes, education is certainly in somewhat of a crisis with the failed experiments year after year that we've had. It's been the biggest failure of the new South Africa education. And what we have to do is simply focus on ensuring that children can read, write and calculate as the number one priority. Mike Thiel is headmaster of the Dominican Convents, an independent school in downtown Johannesburg. The school offers a revolutionary educational model in South Africa by ensuring a mix of children from every economic base, from the very wealthy to the orphans and street children who come to them from shelters. I'm not here to, to teach middle of the road. I'm here to produce leaders because that's what this country needs. Crime, uh, poverty, HIV uh, and AIDS, all of those issues are incredibly real and you see it on a day-to-day -day basis. We have lost a huge number, of particular parents, um, to, to diseases like HIV and AIDS. But just generally, it's a, a very fractious, very fragile society that many of our children go home to. Um, and as much as our environment tries to give them the, 
the belief and the aspiration that they can be anything they like, they're still going back into difficult environments. So we need to actually get them beyond the, um, the point of saying, oh, I'm never going to cope with that, to, to realizing that with the right input here, that they can make that difference. We believe that that, along with teaching them the social justice issues and making sure that that's really embedded in them, is going to make a, a huge difference to, to the South Africa of the next 30, 40 years. I asked some of the children how they perceive their fledgling democracy. If you were, each of you, able to just go into a cabinet meeting with the South African uh, government and you could tell them, and you could tell them, and you could tell them, I, I want you to concentrate on, this is, this is what I think the biggest challenge this country faces and I want you all to concentrate on it. What would that challenge be? Teachers, actually. Yeah. Teachers. Yeah. They're not paying teachers enough money to actually teach us and they're actually not seeing the point that we need a lot of teachers in our schools. What about you? Um, what I you personally think? think the biggest challenge is poverty in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Poverty, like the, the, the biggest, the line between the white South Africans and black South Africans, the, the poverty, majority of us are black. Mm -hmm. And with poverty, then everything happens. HIV increases, our education is bad. Crime increases, everything. So the, the major thing, the fundamental thing, is poverty. If they could tackle that. Go ahead. Our biggest problem is corruption. There's going to come a time for your generation where, you know, yeah. the automatic sort of uh, vote for the ANC isn't always going to yeah. be there. No, I don't think so. I think what's going to happen with us is we're slowly going to let go of the yeah. ANC. Because now I feel what ha what's happening is our parents continuously vote for the ANC. Almost as if it was a religious they, duty, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, because they took them out of apartheid. But we are born free. We are born free kids. And thank you, ANC, you've done your job. We, our parents have given you the chance to be in, in office for so long. But you haven't done what you promised us. We will, <laughs> we will pick who is right for the job and not who promises perks. And slowly, I think ANC is going to fall away. Do you think BE or Black Economic Empowerment has, has been good and could be good for your generation? Those who have benefited from BEE can now change their lifestyles and change their children's lifestyles. BEE is for our parents. I don't think BEE should be for, for us. For you. In the case of our generation, we've all had like equal chances, as like black kids and white kids. And I don't think anyone should make any excuses and want to be helped like more than the other. I mean, we've all had equal opportunities. Although in theory everyone is now an equal member of society, in practice the reality is quite different. This is an informal squatter camp on the outskirts of Johannesburg in what is the richest province in South Africa. But this isn't your usual squatter camp in this country. And it tells the story of the changing face of poverty in South Africa, a story where over half a million white South Africans find themselves living below the poverty line. During apartheid, the government created what was effectively sheltered employment for poor and unskilled Afrikaners. Irrespective of your education, you were virtually guaranteed a job for life, often in the civil service or state-owned industries. The ANC's affirmative action policies, designed to counter the effects of a history of discrimination, have changed all this. Is the question and problem of white poverty and a white underclass in South Africa well known? Not at all. Um, I think it's a, it's a very, it's, we call it the, the quiet poverty. I think a lot of people feel guilty that because of apartheid, um, they don't even want to really address the problem or admit it here, even Afrikaans speaking people for that matter. At the moment we're looking at 600,000 um, white people in the country, mostly Afrikaans speaking, are falling into poverty. But looking at it from the other side, there'd be people in Kailicha or Alexandria and these townships and say, look, we've been suffering this and more yes. for decades, so why make a special case out of white poverty suddenly? We don't want any special treatment. We just want our people to, to have the same type of opportunities. We also get the sense that government thinks that these people deserve it. And I'm saying that there's been mistakes in the past, but you don't correct a mistake through another mistake. 
What is the condition of people here? I mean, are people optimistic that things are going to change for them? Uh, the people start believing that they will get houses and they will get a better life to rent in. But I know and I know that's not the truth. You will stay where you are. There's no houses, there's no better life. There's no future for us. There is no future. Should you be raising issues of race? Absolutely. Whether white people or black people are oppressed in South Africa, it should be raised as major issues. Because actually, at the end of the day, white citizens and black citizens have very similar interests. They have similar values. They're struggling with unemployment. They're struggling with economic inequalities. They're struggling with the quality of education. They're struggling with the quality of health care. Those are issues that transcend race. Do you think that South Africa is ever going to try to escape looking at everything through race? A thing about white and black and that whatever, you know, to me it's not, you know, you're both the same, you're the same blood, it's just the skin colour that's different. I don't think most people in South Africa are going to change. Not the old people anyway, you know, that grew up in that way. Our new generation, maybe they'll change. Although many South Africans want to put the past behind them, the legacy of apartheid can still be felt throughout the country. Cape Town was where European settlers first came ashore in order to colonize southern Africa. And Europeans are still coming to this city, but this time as tourists, because Cape Town symbolizes the postcard perfect image of South Africa, a tourist mecca. But travel beyond the tourist areas and well-to-do neighborhoods and you'll find a very different city. One with deep divisions that epitomize the vast disparities between rich and poor across the country. In the townships that surround the city, the majority of people are unemployed with little or no hope of escaping the cycle of poverty. There is a, a huge competition for, for scarce resources and employment Job opportunities is, is one of those um, resources um, that, that is under pressure and, and very often in arguments by locals. They would accuse foreigners, especially those who are in the country illegally, of being prepared to work at much, much lower salaries. In 2008, tensions culminated in mob-style killings when over 60 foreigners were murdered by South Africans in countrywide xenophobic attacks. The killings came unexpectedly and ordinary South Africans were shocked by the violence. Yet the problem of xenophobia was certainly not a new one. According to some estimates, although there are no formal statistics, there are more refugees in South Africa than there are registered personal taxpayers. The number of illegal immigrants that have poured into South Africa in recent years in search of jobs and a better life is uncertain. But estimates put the figure somewhere between 5 and 8 million in a country where there is over 25% unemployment. It puts a huge strain on an already overburdened social welfare system that is struggling to look after its own people. I went to meet Hussein Omar, a community spokesperson. He took me to Belleville, a suburb just outside Cape Town, where for the last 16 years Somalis have settled in large numbers. Belleville's main road, thriving with businesses run by Somalis, has been nicknamed Mogadishu Avenue after the war-torn capital of Somalia. This, all these shops is owned by Somalians. Here, Abses is a restaurant. But despite its bustling atmosphere, this community lives in fear of violent attacks from their South African neighbors. Hussein introduced me to some of the victims. Sophia is the wife of a shopkeeper who was killed four years ago. Three men came in and every time it was always three men came in and just shot him dead while he was uh, watching the television. Because they had taken all the money uh, and looted it, she had to actually go and borrow the money in order to actually release her husband's uh, corpse uh, for burial. 
Having lost everything, she now lives in the back of a convenience store, dependent upon the charity of the Somali community. The cruel irony is, you know, when we all fled uh, the war and the civil war in uh, Somalia, you know, who would have thought that, you know, you'd come to South Africa and face in this country that we'd all taken to be, you know, the richest and most peaceful, etc., in, in, in all of Africa, that we'd find ourselves in the midst of uh, all of this. The whole point is, you know, Somalis have come here as migrants, as, as refugees. And when you come to this country, the government says you can come in, but, you know, you have to support yourself. And how do we support ourselves as refugees? Well, we have to trade, we have to sell things, we have to survive. And it's because of that, the people who are here, the South Africans, don't want us to survive in this way. Uh, because, you know, they think we're taking their jobs away. <laughs> What Sophia was just saying is that um, when you look on the TV, uh, you watch and you see the government and the authorities saying, well, we're doing you know, a lot to try and tackle this uh, issue of, of xenophobia. But she's saying it's been four years since my uh, husband has died and no one in the government or the police knows whether I'm still alive or dead. Hussein next took me to visit a man who was attacked and blinded while he was working in his shop. Uh, one day he was just, you know, in his shop. He'd been threatened quite a few times uh, before that. Had told the police that he had been threatened by one individual in particular. The police didn't do uh, anything. Um, this man returned. We saw uh, He had a acid in a small glass bottle and just uh, threw it uh, on his face. Police can do check the Ninka Maga is he's told they've told the police who this guy is, but to date nothing has uh, nothing has happened. I asked him, do you you know, after everything that he's been through having left Somalia, does he regret coming to, you know, South Africa? And he says, Yes, sometimes I, I, I do feel that. Talking to members of the Somali community in Belleville, I realized that almost daily incidents occur, many of which are never reported. But in the township of Kailicha, a mostly black township where there is a lot of unemployment, the situation is, if anything, worse. Hussein took me to the site of a Somali shop that had been looted and destroyed. There was just a mass attack and uh, all the guys who were working in the Somali shop that was here just ran for it and uh, just completely reduced to uh, ashes now. I didn't see they do what they did here. Mm. You see, I just heard from my husband when I came back and they, they already, the place was already burned, mm. you see. But it's not a matter of xenophobia, it's just a part of a crime. A crime they took advantage yeah. from Somalians. Other African nationals were also victims of recent attacks. I'm from Ghana, I've been here for the past 11 years. Mm. They came to my house, took everything of my people here, they all saw it. So now this is all what I've got. Increasingly, and under the guise of xenophobia, criminals are targeting the businesses and homes of foreigners. People locally here are just shouting that, oh, look, the foreigners are back, the foreigners are back, just when, when we showed up here. So I think we'd better go. Xenophobia is not the issue. Criminality is. Killing is killing. So unless our government teaches our people that criminality, regardless of who the victim is, is unacceptable, you know, they are not going to go anywhere. There are more than enough indications that in some areas uh, there's an organized attempt at using xenophobia simply as an excuse to attack and rob uh, people who have businesses, especially informal businesses. But I don't think criminality can be used, as, as is now happening, as the single, uh, a single explanation for why we have xenophobia. Dealing with xenophobia has to be completely above politics in South Africa. But it's not above international politics. I mean, the, if you want to do some serious root cause analysis, you have to look at the phenomenon of the ultimate failed state, and that is Somalia, the ultimate failed state. Now, I sometimes get really frustrated with the United Nations. They seem to be totally impotent 
to do what has to be done about rogue states, about failed states, that make life a total misery for their own people, that force their people into exiles or becoming refugees. Ultimately, we have a situation where countries who really cannot afford to support migrants from across the subcontinent then face the challenge and are blamed when problems arise. The root cause is in the failed state on our subcontinent and the impotence of the international community represented by the United Nations to do anything about it. Despite the challenges it faces, South Africa is the largest player in Africa, the third fastest growing region in the world. Since the end of apartheid, the country has become one of the movers and shakers in the emerging markets, partly because of its highly developed first world economic infrastructure and partly because of its vast natural resources, now being exported at a premium. We're in the Premier League of Nations which I define as the top 55 nations in the world that are ranked in a global competitiveness survey. None of our banks had to be bailed out. And so the country is broadly in good financial shape. Because of the construction of stadia and other major infrastructure in preparation for the World Cup, the country was to a large extent insulated from the worst effects of the global recession. The question now is will South Africa be able to maintain its growth into the future and cash in on the positive image created by the World Cup in order to ultimately improve the lives of its people? Our next big challenge is creating an entrepreneurial society where we take the, the top entrepreneurs of the informal sector and we graduate them to the formal sector. And, and we, we essentially create a much more inclusive economy. When you say the words Soweto Township to people around the world, probably the last thing that comes into their minds is a glitzy shopping mall full of consumer brands and shops. But this shopping mall is the product of the vision and drive of one man who is symbolized by this statue of the elephant. Richard Moponye is an entrepreneur and property developer best known for building a business empire despite the restrictions of apartheid and his determination to see Soweto Township develop economically. Maponya Moor is the realization of a dream he nurtured for close on 30 years. Refused permission by the apartheid government to open a clothing business in Soweto, in the 60s, Maponya managed to get a permit to allow him to sell dairy products in the township and his business empire grew from there. Nelson Mandela was the lawyer who pleaded his case. I started with uh, 10 guys on bicycle, selling in the street. Many of my friends, they called me um, uh, an economic activist. I was uh, fighting the economical battle to say, a black man given a chance, he can make it. And I, I proved this. When the powers that be would turn me down, I would go home and go back again and knock at the door until the door opens. But Richard Maponya is very much the exception rather than the rule. South Africa is one of the least entrepreneurial countries in the world, a situation exacerbated by a lack of skills training and education among the greater population. It is an area of the South African economy that urgently needs to be tackled in order to help the country build a healthy middle class that will close the gap between rich and poor. Government has to come up with a, a plan that can be better than BEE and establish a bank that would understand where a black person comes from. But despite such persuasive calls, there are signs that the country may be heading in the wrong direction. 
Since the end of the World Cup, there have been a number of events that have made South Africans concerned about the stability of their new democracy and worried that the goodwill created by the successful staging of the World Cup is in danger of eroding. One such development is the Protection of Information Bill, a new piece of legislation proposed by the ANC and currently being deliberated in Parliament that would effectively give the ruling party the power to deem anything they like unfit for public dissemination. This would then make disclosure of related information a criminal offence, punishable with up to 25 years in prison. Don't come here with that white tendency. Not here. Rubbish is what you have covered in that uh, uh, trouser. That is rubbish. That which you have covered in this trouser is rubbish. Okay? You are a small boy. You can't do anything. I didn't come here to be come a out. Go out. Bastard. The ruling party is also calling for the reintroduction of media tribunals unseen in the country since apartheid. Such proposals call into question Zuma's promises to deal with corruption, accountability and transparency in government. Many fear the new bill will put an end to the free press that has been exposing the massive graft and corruption within the government and ruling party. Moreover, the bill might jeopardize the constitutional rights of South Africans. South Africa still seems to be a country which could go either way, its future still in the balance, with both good and bad acting as a counterpoint to the other. It's a very peculiar place. It's in a lot of ways, it's both the first and the developing world in one social formation. It can have, reflect and demonstrate the most positive aspects of democratic participation. And yet, on another level, depict the worst aspects of human existence. And you have to ask yourself, how does it live, how does it do this all simultaneously? The 2010 FIFA World Cup will be organized in South Africa. We have at root in our country more capacity for respect and celebrating difference and working together and having fun together than almost any other complex nation on earth. Then of course we, a bit bipolar, we kind of swing to the other end of the spectrum again, but we never lose sight of that glimpse, of that vision. And we need to keep on having that vision. What we have to understand is it's a much more complex formation than simple answers. And often I believe the international community looking for easy answers, looking for an easy message to communicate to its foreign audience, tends to simplify the South African problematic, rather than grappling with how to actually articulate it. Because if you can articulate the South African problematic, you articulate the universal problematic. In that way, South Africa is a microcosm of the world we live in at this moment. At this point, the true cost of the government's decision to spend billions of dollars on infrastructure such as stadiums rather than education and healthcare is unknown. Similarly, the social benefits of uniting the country around football have to be weighed against the cost of prioritising a game over pressing needs such as housing. I'm about to get on the Khao train, which is the brand new high-speed rail link which connects Africa's biggest commercial district, Santon, to Johannesburg International Airport in 15 minutes, a journey that used to take at least an hour by car. But this isn't a train for ordinary commuters. It's not for the average man on the street. It's really for tourists and well-heeled business travelers. Depending on your perspective, the World Cup was either a huge success for South Africa or a monstrous waste of resources that this country desperately needs. But most people I've spoken to believe that the World Cup 
has had a good and lasting legacy for South Africa, not just in a direct economic sense, but it also captured a magical moment and a real sense of optimism about this country. But the challenges for the ruling ANC government remains the desperate attempt to try to narrow the wide socio-economic gap in this country, which now cuts across the racial lines, across both black and white. There is also another sense in which the World Cup has had a lasting legacy for this country. People in South Africa will now expect and demand more of their government. Now they have seen what can be achieved. It remains to be seen if the ANC delivers on these demands. But the remarkable thing about South Africa is that it has the extraordinary capacity not only to defy its own history, but to defy the predictions that the rest of the world has made of it.